Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, I mean, this is what I do. I love gardening so much, and this is the best time of year, um, which is hard to compete with fall and harvest season, but I personally love the changing of the seasons uh, and the warming up, well, supposed to be warming up <laughs> eventually, uh, spring weather and seeing all the fresh blooms on the trees and all the beautiful plants starting to show through the soil. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna go through um, a few different things. I'm gonna start off with just the, the benefits of gardening. There's a lot, you know, psychological, physical, and of course, environmental. And then I'll go into um, some practical how-to, how to get started. Um, so yeah, to get into a little bit about my background first, uh, my name is Nate Fournier. I've um, had a few different hard pivots in my career trajectory. I started off as a mechanical engineer. I went to WPI. I'm local uh, here. I live in Worcester right now. Um, I got into real estate investing and I became a general contractor and I with a big emphasis on green building and energy efficient building design. Um, and it was kind of a common thread ever since I graduated from college. It was really like 2013 when I stumbled across the word permaculture. Now it's becoming a lot more mainstream. I'm not sure how many people have heard the word permaculture, but it's this idea of designing a permanent culture, which is quite counterintuitive to the current way that we sort of, that we live in, in our current societies. There's a lot of fragility. And so the whole idea is to develop a resilient society. And a lot of that comes down to creating a permanent agriculture system. Um, there's lots of problems with our current conventional industrial agricultural system, and there's just so much opportunity to do a better job. And so um, that's what I'm here to do. It's kind of my calling, my passion in life is to help teach people how to grow their own food, how to take control of their own lives and their own health and wellness while uh, enjoying the beauty of it all. And so I started Home Harvest Central Mass just last year, um, where we do edible landscaping and construction. And our mission is to transform grass spaces into attractive and regenerative edible ecosystems. So let's get into the benefits. So gardening, um, of course, there are so many physical benefits that go well beyond the actual nutrition of the food itself. Uh, first is vitamin D. You know, there's nothing better than absorbing sunlight and it's so important. There's tons of research now that shows direct correlations between vitamin D and our immune systems. And so a lot of this um, that I'm gonna be talking about is very current in our society right now with uh, COVID-19, this pandemic, uh, boosting our immune systems is so important and it's so easy by getting out in the garden. Um, vitamin D is really important as human beings. We are animals. It's only been a uh, hundred years, you know, since we've been cooped up inside offices all day long, whereas we've co-evolved with the earth and the sun for for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And, uh, and we need sunlight. It's really important to get outside and enjoy some sunlight. Uh, microbiome support, again, tons of new research that shows that there's a direct correlation between the bacteria and the organisms within our gut and our cognitive function. I think there's so much power in, in this connection and, and more and more studies have been coming out. Um, you know, depression, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, brain fog, memory issues, confusion. These are so prevalent in our society today. And I believe that there's so much power in uh, eating locally grown organic food uh, to help with a lot of these these issues. And a lot of that comes from the soil itself. So conventional industrial agriculture, you know, we developed this great way to increase production by soaking our fields in pesticides. And these pesticides kill all of the bad bacteria bacteria and all the bad organisms, as well as all of the good ones. Again, we have co-evolved with nature. We are part of nature and we just continually brute force our way through it and try to reverse, try to engineer our own systems when, you know, mother nature is the ultimate engineer and, and these things are really important. So by growing organic, eating organic, you know, it's okay to have a little bit of soil in your food every now and then because the bacteria is actually really important for our gut health. Um, and stress relief, you know, a lot of these physical health benefits are also psychological health, but we know that stress is the leading cause of disease. It dramatically decreases our immune system. Stress is, again, more prevalent now than ever before. And I believe the root cause of lots of stress for most people is this feeling of, of helplessness. You know, there's a lot of awful things happening in the world that there's nothing we can do about. And that's a, it's a difficult position to be in. Um, so by taking control of at least something, which very well could be your garden, you know, planting a seed and watching it grow and caring for it and knowing that 
it's, it's up to you to allow to help that seedling survive and it's really rewarding and really stress relieving tons of research showing the stress reducing benefits of gardening and of course the produce itself there's actually again lots of research proving that the nutrient density of our food that's grown in conventional agriculture is, is really lacking. You know, we, we pump the soil, we pump our vegetables with NPK, which is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, which are the three, you know, I like to correl you know, think about it like fat, protein, and carbs. So the vegetables grow nice and big, they grow fast, they're nice and green, uh, and, and all we care about in industrial agriculture is, is the weight, the volume of, of produce that we can create. But really it's just a lot of water and, and there's no vitamins in it anymore. And so of course then we have to supplement with all these different vitamins that are produced in questionable ways as well. And so um, by growing our own organic produce, we can bring the vitamins back into our food, and it can be absolutely enormous, uh, make a huge difference. Um, these are just some examples where, you know, a 13-fold increase in, in magnesium and these antioxidants, 50% higher, uh, you know, lead and calcium, all of these minerals and nutrients, uh, and a lot of that has to do with, with living soil. And so I'm going to be talking a lot about the importance of soil, and it's something that we've overlooked. Again, industrial agriculture uses soil as, it's not soil, it's it's dirt, and there's a big difference there, where dirt is lifeless, and it's just used as a medium to hold up a plant, whereas living soil is, is absolutely crucial, because it's the life in the soil that is able to transform these different minerals into vitamins that the plant can uptake in such a way that Again, they've evolved over time, they've created this symbiotic relationship, and uh, it's really, really important because then we eat that food and it gives us those vitamins and all of those immune boosting benefits. So physical is huge, and then of course psychological as well. I believe that there's something to be said for coming home from a stressful day work, even if it's just inside of your office and stepping out into your backyard and experiencing nature. I think there's, from a, from a psychological health perspective, there's so much to be said about the happiness that that can bring us. And, and the stress relief, again, is so important. Um, improving depression, and just general cognitive function. And there's actually, again, the life in the soil, there's a specific microbacterium that is found in soil that, and it boosts serotonin in the brain, and it's a straight antidepressant. So like, we don't need all these pharmaceutical chemicals. A lot of what we need is right in our backyards, and we have to facilitate these interactions, and we have to learn, and that's a big thing. Like. You know, we used to know a lot of indigenous cultures knew these things, knew that medicine and, and the power that nature has, and we, we've ignored that. We've forgotten it. We've turned our eye, uh, we've turned our back to nature and, and forced our way through by creating synthetic, oper synthetic options that are not as effective, and it, it's really sad. So lots of opportunity to increase our psychological health. And of course, environmental health. By gardening, organically, there's so much opportunity to reduce chemical and industrial pollution. We're still spraying all of our conventionally grown crops with glyphosate, and more, there's just been a study released that has proven that it is a carcinogen. It's irrefutable, and I like to think of it like lead paint or asbestos. Like, we used it for so long, it was great when we first invented it, and then all of a sudden, 30 years later, we're like, oh no, we made a big mistake. And I believe we're in the same situation with glyphosate. We are at the crossroads right now where you know, I can't believe it's still sold on the shelves. People still use it all the time. And it's just a, it's, it's, it's a sad reality that we just don't know better. And so I think that that's going to change really soon. I, I hope it changes really soon. Um, more legislation coming through to, to really to ban this awful, awful substance, which is now in our groundwater, it's in the air, it's killing our pollinators and our birds, and it's, it's really bad. So uh, to get more optimistic is that we can make a huge difference in our own backyards. I mean, if we plant native plants, we plant some edibles, and uh, we improve the resilience of the natural systems around us, these natural systems that support humanity, support all life on Earth. We're not so separate and distinct from the rest of nature. We are part of nature. And it's important that we reflect that in our habits and in the way that we interact with 
what we have control over, which is typically our lawns. We're not, you know, the age, I believe the age of the expansive grass lawn is over and it's our responsibility to facilitate this change as the cognitive beings that walk this earth, you know, being, having the intelligence that we have, like we know better. We know better. Maybe we didn't before, we didn't know any better, but now there's no excuse. The research has shown and it just, it's intuitive as well. It just makes sense every way you look at it. We're going to start converting our grass lawns into native habitat, into native meadows, into these systems that mimic forests that we can manage. I believe it's our responsibility to manage them in an effective way without losing, without totally destroying the biodiversity. That's really what it comes down to is biodiversity. Tons of opportunity as well to sequester carbon. I mean, there's so much opportunity to use our lawns and the soils that we have control over as enormous carbon sinks. Um, soil holds carbon, plants convert carbon, CO2, into oxygen that we breathe and it holds carbon in the soil. So we don't have to engineer some new way to sequester carbon. It's all around us and I believe that just through agriculture alone we have the opportunity to dramatically reduce the amount of carbon that we release into the atmosphere. And collectively if we do it together then we can make an enormous impact and reverse a lot of these issues that we've been creating over the years. And it's not about sustainability, you know, sustainability has its place and I understand it, but you know, it's like we have the flu, the earth has a flu and the virus is humanity, not to again, sound too pessimistic, but we don't want to sustain the current situation that we're in. Like we're too deep. We have to regenerate. And so everything that I do, I look at through the lens of regeneration. We're healing. We're reversing the damage that we've done. And we're doing that by regeneration. A huge, huge part of this is getting rid of the American lawn. We are so attached to our perfectly manicured grass lawns and it's a, it's a broken logic. It's a fallacy that we have created to, to look good with our neighbors. And I, I think that it's, imperative for us to to change that paradigm where the person on the street with growing a garden in his front yard isn't isn't ridiculed and scoffed at with their nose people turn their nose up against because it's ugly and and switch that around and everybody has a native wildflower meadow in their front yard and nobody has grass and the one person who does have grass and who still use glyphosate and all these chemicals to manage that grass should be should be ridiculed i mean it's it's a collective effort here and it's it's uh, it's going to take a community it's going to take a village um, 30 to 40 million acres of land is grass, which is not native. Most grass that we have, Kentucky bluegrass, and it's just, it's not native. It's not invasive per se, but it is so demanding. It doesn't belong here. So that's why it requires so much water and so much fertilization, because it doesn't want to be here when there are so many other alternatives. Uh, micro clover is a great lawn alternative that I, that I often, I pitch really hard because there's a lot of native clovers that work just as well. They're, they're much more drought resistant and it's just a better, better option. Um, lawnmower gasoline emissions, synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, they leach into our waterway. Over 50% of our fresh water is used in our lawns. More than all of agriculture combined, we, we soak our lawns with, with potable drinking water and we have a serious water crisis on our hands and it's just foolish and it's just a better way. And so it's exciting because we know how to do it and, and we're taking action, which is great. Um, yeah. So we're growing food, not lawns. It's the new movement and uh, it's happening, whether you like it or not. So there's a whole generation of people coming up and, uh, and I encourage everybody to get on board. It's, a, it's so much more exciting than a plain grass lawn. We can get tons of food and native plants. It's awesome. Um, I meant to ask earlier, but let's go ahead and pop up a poll question and, and put it out there. Who currently has a garden? Um, how long have you been gardening? And just, just think about it. I think the poll question just asks um, if you currently garden a uh, vegetable garden. And let's see, uh, let's see what the results are. I'm curious. Okay, I'm launching the poll right now. Can everyone see the poll? Is everyone seeing the poll? Someone could put it in the chat.
Okay, I think people are putting the responses in the Q and A. Um, uh, veggies and butterfly garden, a lot of yeses, um, and then they do see the poll. Okay, so if you want to just um, respond to the poll, uh, we can kind of get a percentage of folks that do have an active vegetable garden. Um, if you're able to do that. Okay, it looks like we have a number of folks that um, do have a vegetable gardening. Awesome. That's great. And I've seen an enormous boom in new gardeners just this year, last year w with COVID, people being at home more often. Um, we're riding a wave right now, um, which is one good thing that's come out of this, I think, is people are reconnecting with their, their lawns and with their gardens and trying to grow their own food. Because we saw firsthand how fragile the systems are, how quickly the grocery shelves, grocery store shelves become empty. And that feeling, I mean, that's a that's a nervous feeling when you go to the store and you can't get what you want. We're so we're privileged to have that opportunity. And um, again, it does it doesn't take much. One big storm, one big uh, one pandemic to uh, to throw all of our logistics out of whack. And I think it's it's empowering to know that we have the power to grow our own food and we can take care of ourselves no matter what's happening in the world around us. Awesome. So yeah, we'll keep on rolling. So let's get into some how-to. So uh, for those of you who haven't started a garden yet, and even those of you who have, just to give some tips, I'm going to run through um, the options here. So the first things first is to find the sun. Sun is your best friend when it comes to gardening. Most of the vegetables that we grow are heavy feeders, and they require full sun. Um, of course, there are like leafy greens and herbs can do well in part shade, but most of the tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and squashes and cucumbers, like most things are, are need, need full sun. Um, so once you find the sun, then uh, even if you, you, you have to choose, you know, if you want to grow in ground, if you want to grow in containers, or you want to grow in raised beds, and there's pros and cons to each. Um, so depending on space, if you just have a balcony, you know, and that's one thing that's really important to know that if you don't, if you live in an apartment or you don't have a, a big yard, um, there's still tons of opportunity, you know, even inside, if you have a south facing or a west facing window, you can get some production out of or a balcony. Um, it's important to know here in the Northern Hemisphere that the sun uh, does come, it's facing south. So any south facing wall, uh, the sun is slightly tilted such that you're gonna get the most sun exposure in any south facing area. And there's a lot of great apps as well. Um, on your phone you can get, I think Sunseeker is a good app where it actually shows like a augmented reality where and you can look and shows you ex the exact path of the sun and you can use that to figure out where you're gonna get shade. Um, and so yeah, so um, you can do in-ground containers and you can make containers look pretty as well. You know, you can have it as like a decor, you know, set up on your deck, uh, just similar to this, or you can just have them in plastic bins, you know, with holes drilled in the bottom. Drainage is important with containers. You all, you definitely need some drainage. Um, but yeah, these are on little wheel, wheelie carts too. So the pots can be moved around. So it's, it's adaptive and, and um, pretty cool. And my favorite are raised beds. Raised beds are great just because you don't have to worry about a lot of the things you have to worry about with in-ground gardens. With in-ground gardens, it's a little bit more difficult to keep the weeds out. You have to get a soil test. I always recommend if you're going to grow in-ground, it's really important to get your soil tested first because um, otherwise you don't know what you're working with. And then you have to add certain amendments, all organic amendments I highly encourage, uh, blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, even kelp, uh, fish emulsion. These are all great organic fertilizers. Um, and compaction is really important. So I, so we don't till anymore either. The days of tilling are over. Again, the research shows we can grow better, healthier produce without tilling. Um, so, so that's great because it's a lot of work to till. And so now we, that's off the table. We don't have to till anymore. Uh, with raised beds, you fill it with an exact mix. You usually, a lot of nurseries um, have a planting mix, which is usually like a 50-50 compost uh, topsoil mix. Compost is king uh, in gardening. Um, you know, if the soil's too sandy, add compost. If the soil's too clay, 
you can add compost. If you're lacking certain nutrients, like you can just add compost and, and you're going to be okay. And so organic matter, again, is life. It's, it's the life that comes with the soil and that's so important in creating these healthy veggies. Raised beds are also great. They just drain well, and they have they warm up a little bit sooner in the in the spring and, and retain warmth a little bit longer uh, come fall. And um, yeah, they're great. Although lumber is really expensive right now, don't use pressure treated. Um, a lot of the newer pressure treated is supposedly okay, but um, I know in the past there were certain chemicals that leach into the soil and are uptaken by the vegetables, which again, we're trying to avoid any of that. Um, so cedar is an amazing, beautiful, beautiful wood that can be used for raised beds and is very rot resistant. Um, it's just expensive now, the skyrocketing lumber prices. But, uh, but once you get your container, once you decide if you're going to go in ground, get your soil um, prepared, and I'll go over that a little bit more since we're not going to be tilling, um, you buy your seedlings. And so I highly recommend to plan out what you want to eat and think about what you eat the most. What are your favorite veggies? And, and just if, especially if you're just getting started, grow what you love. Uh, that just makes it easy. I love breakfast, and so I love to grow my breakfast mix, you know, my peppers, onions, potatoes, and tomatoes is like my go-to um, as well as lots of other stuff, but that's like where I like to start. Um, and buying the seedlings is is easy because you just get them from the nursery. I highly encourage you to shop local, go to a nurse local nursery, and and buy this the seedling starts. Um, don't go to Home Depot. You know they just they're shipped from across the country. It's it's not not ideal. It's much better to support local businesses, and the seedlings themselves are going to be healthier. Um, and then you just dig a hole and pop them in the ground. You'll have to read the packet. Um, usually it's it's really easy. Tons of information out there to figure out the spacing. Um, that's really the biggest thing is spacing making sure that you don't crowd them, but a lot of times you can go a little bit closer than what they recommend, um, and then you're off and running. It's as easy as that. Uh, tons of information out there. Again, like whatever you are gonna plant, I do recommend just giving it a quick Google and just checking out the, the requirements, um, but don't get over overwhelmed um, because, yeah, there, there's lots of information out there, but it's just a lifelong learning process. So, so that's starting your gut. Yep. Questions. Um, uh, sure. One is, um, how do you prevent groundhogs from eating uh, what you plant? <laughs> My arch nemesis, groundhogs. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you have to fence, and you have to bury the fence six to twelve inches around the perimeter. That's one other benefit of raised beds is that it's actually pretty easy to build a fencing system attached to the the bed itself. Um, you can have like a hinged system where you can lift it up when you want to work in there, or have removable panels that slide in. And so when you want to work, you just pull, you slide them out. Um, you have to have fencing. It's it's a sad reality. It's one of the least sexiest things about gardening is the fencing, and also one of the most expensive <laughs> to do it to really put a nice fence in. Um, but it, it's very important. I also for raised beds always line the bottom with hardware cloth, which is a steel steel mesh, and that prevents um, rodents from digging up from underneath and, and coming up, which, which is important as well. Yes, nothing more disheartening than um, plant getting all your seedlings started, especially when you start from seed three months in. You've been babying them the first day you put them out and they're you wake up the next day and they're gone because the groundhogs uh, i can wow. totally relate so yeah fencing is important and even like in the containers in this picture that they show um just doing a ring around each plant um works as well you know it's a little less practical in, in a larger system but if you just have a small garden um, you can just put a ring of mesh around each one um, similar to that and that'll help um also any thoughts on organic pesticides if that even exists yeah, yeah, there are lots of options. Neem oil is the go-to. Neem oil um, is organic, certified organic. But um, honestly, a lot of the the thinking around pesticides and, and pest management is is back to the soil. You know, the idea is, and, and the science shows that if you build a healthy, living, diverse soil then the plants have the nutrients they need. And not only when you eat those plants, your immune system is boosted, but when the plant is growing, it has the nutrients it needs, the plant's immune system itself is built up. The cell walls are thicker, they work, it just, they are much more disease resistant and pest resistant when it's grown organically and when you don't till the soil. And that has to do with, again, keeping the fungal networks that are within the soil, the, the, the bacteria, the all the microorganisms um, in, in keeping that healthy balance. And then also not planting a thousand of the same crop in one row where one pest comes and it's just has a field day because it, it's so easy to just eat and you know it attracts a ton of ton of 
uh, insects to one area where uh, I highly encourage, again, diversity is king. Uh, looking at nature, nature likes diversity. It's a mix of all kinds of things. And so if you interplant different things and you plant a bunch of different flowers uh, in such a way that it confuses the pests it confu and so that they can't find one plant and swarm it where it's, it's it can, yeah, it's much more diverse and it's a lot uh, better to prevent diseases that way and pests. But neem oil is good, like for aphids. There's a lot of other natural uh, methods of, of pest control, such as um, like there's a, a tomato hornworm. Hornworms are, are pretty ruthless. They'll devour a tomato plant really quickly. But then there's a wasp that uses hornworms. It lays its eggs on the back of a hornworm and it uh, kills the hornworm and eats it from the inside out. And so you can plant certain plants like calendula or uh, like marigolds that attract the wasp that will then find the caterpillar and lay its eggs in it and kill it naturally. Um, the same thing with aphids. Aphids are very common all over tomato plants, pretty common. Um, and ladybugs eat aphids. And so you can actually buy ladybugs, packets of ladybugs as a pest control measure to eat the aphids. And it's just like a symbiotic win-win relationship. And so we're shifting our mindset to think, you know, it's not a war on pests. It's how do we work with nature rather than against it and use the natural mechanisms that already exist to our benefit and just help facilitate those interactions. Um, one quick soil question with regards to kind of pot potting and garden soil, you know, just maybe the difference between the two. Yeah, garden soil, again, is typically used in, in ground, um, so it just has a little bit of a different profile, um, and potting soil is usually blended as a mix. Uh, drainage is, is a big one for that. Usually there's a lot more um, particles that allow better drainage for pots, um, and in ground it may not be quite as necessary because inevitably it will seep um, to the soil around it, so that, that's a big factor. Um, but yeah, when in doubt, add, add some compost to throw a handful of compost in um, and mix it up to, to change the consistency if need be. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, there are lots of options out there for soil. Perfect. Cool. All right. So that's uh, getting the garden started. Pretty high level. I know there's not much detail there. Um, I'm going to go through a few different things. We'll get a little bit deeper into certain aspects. So. Um, yeah, so let's see, what, see what's coming. So now maintenance. A lot of people are intimidated by garden maintenance. They think that a vegetable garden is this big to do and it's a lot of work. And it is. I mean, I don't want to, you know, you have to set your expectations, expect to take for it to take a lot of work. But there's a lot of things you can do to minimize the amount of work that it requires. Number one is water. The most important thing you have to do and the most common reason gardens fail is because um, of lack of watering. And so I highly recommend drip irrigation. Uh, it's just set it and forget it. You know, it's not that expensive. If you're going to go through the effort of planting a garden, I highly recommend setting up irrigation. Drip is the most water efficient and, uh, again, pretty easy to set up. And you put it on a timer, set your hose up so that it's just automated, uh, and you just set it and forget it, which is great. I typically do three days a week, uh, a pretty heavy soak three days a week, um, usually at like 5 a.m., before the sun rises so that all the water doesn't just evaporate right away uh, or like later in the day, 9 p.m. So you can do that twice a day for three days a week. Um, again, depending on what you're growing, leafy greens are less water demanding than tomatoes and squash and peppers. And so just, again, look up the requirements and um, you can always adjust that pretty easily on the fly. So get familiar as well with the soil itself and see usually from uh, just by sticking your finger in the soil and pulling it out, you can you can test the moisture that way. And so I recommend playing around and, and doing that often enough to get a, a good sense of it, as well as the color of the soil. Really see how it darkens when it gets wet. And then you can look at it and you can get to the point where you can just look and see like, oh, that soil is dry. You know, you can tell by the color. Um, and so you water a little bit more. And so always iterative and we're always adjusting and, uh, and learning as we go. So uh, yeah, drip irrigation is great. And then mulch. Um, there's this old paradigm where people didn't mulch and I, I don't really understand because it has so many benefits. And so again, mimicking nature, there is never bare soil in nature. Nature doesn't allow it. If there's bare soil, it's going to either get covered with leaves and debris, a natural mulch, or it's going to grow weeds and it's gonna fill that space. And so every square inch of, of 
nature of our lawns, of our gardens, um, is, is, a, is a niche within itself and has certain conditions, just microclimates. And so we have to fill those niches with the things that we want. And so mulching is a great way to do that. Um, I recommend straw. You can get straw bales um, from local nurseries and spread that over your garden beds, the exposed soil. I typically do a thick wood chip in my paths and then I do a pretty heavy straw layer in my garden beds. And that not only prevents weeds from germinating, it helps retain moisture, and so the water stays for a lot longer, it doesn't evaporate, and it eventually breaks down and just feeds more organic matter into the soil. So there, there's no, it's just a win-win-win. So highly recommend mulching. Um, and in weeding, again, you're gonna mulch and it's gonna reduce the amount of weeds. Inevitably, there's always gonna be weeds and it's always gonna be a, a fact of gardening. Um, so just expect it and, and enjoy it. You know, don't get stressed out when you see a bunch of weeds. It is important to keep up. You know, don't let it get too crazy because if you let one weed go to seed and you'll get familiar with that, you see when it flowers, uh, you wanna pull it right as it flowers because after flowering, it turns to seed and then it'll just disperse and it'll, it'll become uh, a perennial issue. So pulling the weeds. Um, I also recommend getting an app on your phone. I recommend Picture This. Um, maybe we can type that in the chat. Picture This is an app that does plant identification and it's fantastic. I can't believe how accurate it is and the more people who use it, the more accurate it becomes. But uh, it's fun to check out what weeds are growing. I mean, we're so used to just pulling things that we don't we don't know what they are, it's just a weed. But uh, just start, you know, it's time to think, redefine what, it, what a weed is because when you start to look, 90% of the weeds that we pull are medicinal or edible or have served some ecological function. Um, a lot of them don't, and so we still have to pull them, but, uh, but it's fun to just learn and, and uh, just familiarize yourselves with things before you go ahead and rip them out. So that's maintenance. Uh, that's really it. You know, watering and weeding is like the, the big ones. So, uh, and then harvesting, of course. And harvesting is important in, in timing your planting such that all of your harvests don't happen at once. Uh, that's a little bit more advanced, but getting to the point where you can stagger your planting times a few weeks apart so that you don't have, you know, 30 pounds of tomatoes all in one week because uh, then they go bad and it's a little bit harder to, to manage. And so spread your plantings uh, accordingly so that you have some time to manage the harvest. And now biointensive gardening. This is again a step further. This is the method that I prefer. Um, there are tons of different ways out there, but this is uh, again beyond organic. This is beyond sustainable. This is regenerative gardening. And biointensive has, again, with the, right, in the, right in the name, it's an intense focus on the biology. And so I love the science of gardening and the soil science, uh, really important, tons of new innovations coming out. But um, a lot of ways to think about it is uh, maximizing the carrying capacity of every square foot, essentially. So how can we stack functions in every square foot of our garden to get the most benefit? You know, not only does this flower produce beautiful scents and beautiful color. It also attracts beneficial pollinators. It also is medicinal. This could be like echinacea, coneflower is a great example of that, or milkweed, you know, very beneficial in many ways. Um, so trying to think, you know, how many functions can we get out of the same space? One great way to do that is to grow vertically. Um, so having arbors and trellises such that they, um, don't have to spread along the ground and take up tons of space, we can grow vertically and it, we get tons of production out of there. And I love arbors. I think that there's this fundamental human uh, experience that we get by walking underneath an arbor and being able to pick uh, whether they're grapes or beans or peas um, for, I like, or hardy kiwi is something that we can grow around here. It's a little invasive, but um, if you manage it well. Uh, but yeah, walking underneath an arbor, especially when you're coming from a busy day, you walk under an arbor and then into the garden and it's just like, ah, it's a whole different experience and it's really pleasant. Um, always keeping the soil covered. Again, going back to mulch, uh, really important, keeping the soil covered. Only use organic fertilizers. I already talked about those. Kelp and fish meal are really common. Uh, there's different seaweed and, um, and all kinds of different meal blends and, and compost. And we'll get into compost a little bit more uh, later. I'll tell you how, how to do that. Um, but compost is really important, Has so, serves so many functions in the garden. And you get worms, which are cute. <laughs> Uh, and no-till. And again, like I said, the days of tilling are over. So what we do instead, uh, 
you have three options. Number one is to sheet mulch, like is shown in this picture. If you're breaking new ground, if you're establishing a new garden, uh, one way you can do that is by just laying cardboard. You know, all of our of us who are Amazon Prime addicts, we have plenty of cardboard. If we peel the tape off the cardboard and just flatten it, lay it down, that'll smother the grass, and then we cover that cardboard with wood chip. And um, that way it suppresses all the weeds, and then we can just cut a hole in the cardboard, dig the way of the wood chips, and plant what we want. And that's just enough for the plants that we plant to fully establish um, before the cardboard breaks down, and then it just it feeds into the soil, and, it, and it's, uh, it's a win-win-win. Because again, the biology in the soil, the, the fungal networks are amazing. There's like miles and miles of, of these fungal networks that are able to sense like the internet of, of nature. It's amazing, absolutely incredible. And they can sense when there's a nutrient deficiency for one tree and it can pull nutrients from a way other side of the property and bring it to the plant that, that needs it. And it can uh, alert plants that there's an infestation of a certain pest and, the, and the, allow the plant to boost its own immune system and set up defenses against this plant. And uh, it's absolutely incredible. So sheet mulching, um, you can also solarize, which is taking a big black tarp and laying it over the grass and just letting the sun cook the, the soil and that'll kill all the weeds. It'll kill the weed seeds and then um, then you can mulch and plant right into that. And then you can also, um, and it, this is a, a fine line, right? There's no dig gardening, no till gardening, um, but I honestly don't mind uh, double digging is a method through the biointensive uh, realm where you take a broad fork, which is just big, a big giant fork and you step on it and it slices the soil because aeration is really important. Compaction is the killer of most plants. And so if you're able to slice the ground such that you allow air and water to get in, um, then that's, that's really important. Um, and you're not necessarily totally destroying all the biology. Um, you're disrupting it a little bit, but you only have to do it once. You only do it when you initially establish the garden. And that's after your soil sample, you can add your amendments, um, add compost, and then just slice it and then mulch over it. And then that'll allow the roots to go deeper. Lifelong learning, uh, it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, it takes time. There's so much information out there about gardening, but it takes a long time to, to learn. Uh, so learn as much as you can with what you have, but also just take action and, and continue to learn. You know, the more one gardens, the more one learns. And the more one learns, the more one realizes how little one knows. It's a very humbling experience, and I'm learning new things every day, and so just ex have that expectation up front. You're going to make mistakes, tragedies are going to happen, seed things are going to die, groundhogs are going to eat all your stuff, but just understand that, like, now I know. <laughs> I got to get a fence next time. Uh, and community. Community is so important, and I believe that there's so much opportunity to connect with our communities through gardening. I think community gardens themselves are so important. I volunteer all the time. There's lots of great organizations in Worcester, um, tons of community gardens that help bring people together and help share resources. And it's, a, again, a fundamental human need. We need community. Um, and if you're not able to garden yourself, then I highly, or even if you are, but you just want supplemental, if it's a small garden, you want more vegetables, I highly recommend um, finding a, a CSA. CSA is Community Shared Agriculture, um, where you find a local farm and you're investing in that farm. You usually pay upfront for a whole season's worth of vegetables, and then every week you either go pick up or you get delivered a, a box of fresh vegetables. And it's whatever's in season, whatever they're growing, you don't really have much choice, most of them, uh, what, what you're going to get. But then it's exciting because you get to try new things and, and try different dishes and things, and uh, it's a great way to support the community. So I highly recommend that. And we can go ahead and put the poll out. I know uh, we're kind of running out of time, so maybe we can put the poll and then uh, have people answer that and I'll, I'll just keep cruising through and then we can, uh, we can review at the end. How does that sound? Absolutely, sorry. Um, yep, we are getting responses in. And this is, um, do you participate in a community shared agriculture program? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious how many people already do. All right, I think we've got most everyone who has voted. Go ahead and close the poll and then share out the results. We have 27% that said yes and 73% said no. Oh, wow, that's actually more than I expected. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, so find some local ones. Uh, I'm not sure geographically where most of you are located, but uh, my good friend just started a new one out in Oxford. Um, 
but yeah, if you just Google CSA Central Massachusetts uh, or wherever you are, then there's there's tons of options and meat as well. You can get meat CSAs uh, for locally, organically, um, really sustainably grown meat, which which is awesome as well. Lilac Hedge is out of Rutland and they have, they have awesome meat. Um, I guess it's not Lexington, cheap. Oh, sorry, uh, Nate. I guess Lexington also has a great one that donates all the food to local food pantry. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's more popular now than ever. So there's tons, tons of opportunity there. Um, all right, so yeah, so we'll keep going, getting a little bit deeper as we go. So now seed starting. If you're a pretty experienced gardener, you don't want to just go to the nursery and get your seedling starts, um, then you can start seed. And it's a little bit more intimidating, but it's totally possible and it's not that difficult. You just need a few supplies. You have to have your setup uh, ready to go before you, you get started. And so what you'll need are um, seed starting trays. These are everywhere. Again, most local nurseries stock them. I like the six pack seeds. There's all different sizes and stuff, but these six packs usually work pretty well. Um, you're going to need a few of those. Some specific seed starting soil um, that, that is important. It's a very fine textured soil that helps germination. I recommend uh, Coast of Maine. They're, they're fantastic. They have an organic seed starter mix. LED grow lights have gotten so much more affordable than they used to be. They are uh, super efficient as well, so they don't require much electricity, and they're very effective. So you ha will need some grow lights and some shelving. Um, a lot of the common metal shelving that you see is, is super easy, and you can have a setup just like this uh, with your lights and, and the shelving such that, again, it's all, so you can set it up on a timer, and all you have to do is drop the seeds in and just keep them watered. Um, I like the, the double tray system like is shown there where you can water underneath bottom watering, it's called, is a lot more effective just because you're not splashing the tops of the soil and disturbing the seeds as they go. Um, and then the seeds themselves, of course, the most important part. Um, Non-GMO organic seeds, it's really important. I also recommend bio uh, regionally adapted seeds. Regionally adapted seeds just mean that they were grown in the Northeast. And uh, that's important because a lot of the seeds you get at Home Depot were grown in California and it just doesn't make sense. They don't they don't want to be here. It's not it's not the same. So a lot of these companies I highly recommend, they have grown and adapted and selected varieties that do well here. Um, high mowing seeds, fantastic, Fruition, Johnny's, and Fedco. These are like the top big brands. There's a lot, a lot of other ones. There's some seed saver, um, the seed saving company, Seed Savers, I believe is, is a great one as well. Um, yeah, so, so make sure you find these. A lot of local nurseries will have display cases with these seeds um, right in stock, or you can buy them online. And it's really exciting to start your seeds. Timing is really important. Um, I see so many people start too early. That's they, Everyone gets excited when spring starts to come, the first warm day, and they start their seeds. And then by the time you go to plant them out, usually planting like tomatoes, you want to plant after the last frost date with a little bit of a buffer. Um, I usually say Memorial Day. If you plant after Memorial Day, bring the tomatoes outside. But if you start too early, you'll have these massive tomato plants in your tiny little you can up, you can uh, put them in solo cups um, after they grow too big out of the seeds starting trays. Then you can put them into into pot them up into bigger pots. Um, solo cups are really common; they work well, super cheap. Um, but yeah, so you just want to start. Don't want to start too early because they'll get root bound and they won't thrive once you get them in the soil. So again, it's all on the seed packets. Tons of information that has the spacing, has uh, the timing, and everything. So just knowing the last frost date, which I typically say uh, is Memorial Day. And uh, compost, it's really exciting. Compost, super, super valuable. I recommend vermicomposting. It's with the worms and uh, don't get grossed out. I know they can be cute if you look at them real close, um, but it, it's amazing. It's so incredible. The uh, Just like looking up at the stars at night and being awed by how much is going on up there and, and how inspirational it is. You can do the same by looking down, and it's harder without a microscope, but if you look into a worm bin that's active and healthy and living, there is so much happening, so many microorganisms just doing their job, living their lives, and uh, it's all about breaking down kitchen scraps. So we don't need to throw away our kitchen scraps and contribute to our uh, waste, our broken waste systems. We can, um, it's better than recycling. We can, we can recycle our 
kitchen scraps right at home. And it's really easy. We just need a three bin setup. Um, again, lots of videos online if you want to look up exactly how to do this. But you just um, have three bins. You throw your food scraps in, throw in some shredded newspaper, and start with some worms. And you'll you'll need the red red wiggler are the specific types of worms that you'll need. Um, you can buy them online or, again, from a community's perspective, if your neighbor's growing a garden uh, or if they have their own compost bin, you can just grab a handful uh, and they'll replicate really quickly. So mixing food scraps and shredded paper, I just shred my junk mail. It works really easy. Um, and if it starts to smell, add more paper. It should never smell. I keep mine right underneath my kitchen sink, I mean right under my kitchen table, and uh, it never smells. It's easy as could be. And um, I've also had one right outside my kitchen window. And so uh, having it close by is really important. If you have to walk all the way across your yard to go dump your food scraps, it's unlikely that you'll do it. So setting it up easy so that you can just dump it out the window and throw it right in the bin um, is really important. And it creates black gold, super, super healthy for your plants. And for larger scale, for your yard, um, you want to compost all your leaves. You know, there's so many leaves in the fall. Uh, it's a great opportunity to collect and create your own uh, fertilizers. That's all it comes down to. It's a natural fertilizer. Um, and like your grass clippings, if you do have grass and it's organically managed, no pesticides or fertilizers, then you can um, mix them up in this three-wire mesh system. This is the easiest I found. Um, you can do pallets and stuff, but they'll eventually rot. So having metal or concrete is uh, is ideal. And uh, you just mix them, layer them such that you have um, a good balance of brown and green material. Brown is carbon rich and, and green is nitrogen rich. And again, a lot of chemistry and biology that goes into this, but um, it, it's pretty cool because it heats up. So the biology, all the bacteria doing their thing, eating and eating all the, all the material, um, creates tons of heat and the pile can get up to 100, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cool. Um, and it breaks down into very rich organic compost. Now, if you're a little too lazy, um, you can also grow perennials. Now, uh, <laughs> most annual vegetables that we know of are, are annual. They just grow once and then you have to replant, re-prepare the soil and, and, and go through the whole gardening process every year. Perennials come back every year. And so it's a lot easier in that sense. And this includes all of our woody plants, such as fruit trees, berry bushes, uh, as well as strawberries. There's lots of herbs like sage, mint, thyme, oregano come back year after year. And then there are some other vegetables like asparagus and rhubarb, uh, as well as artichoke. Um, those all come back year after year. And so it's great to include these with your gardens um, such that you don't have to worry about it. Throw some compost on every season, but it's much less work. Um, and this could be backyard orchards. Uh, there's, I've been seeing so many people turning their backyards into orchard systems, uh, which is incredible because it just, again, it just makes sense making the most value of the space that we have. And uh, grass is the antithesis of that. It's the least amount of value. All it is is aesthetic. It's like the foundation of a house. Like our ecology is <laughs> comparable to the foundation of a house where like if we only design our landscapes for aesthetics, like we currently do, then the house is going to collapse. The ecological system around us is going to collapse. And so if we design our landscapes with ecological function in mind as the foundation, using native plants and uh, keeping in mind how the ecology functions, then we'll be, be able to then design aesthetics on top of that. Um, we can grow our fruit trees in a fruit tree guild, which is really cool. Again, mimicking nature, um, filling up all those niches within the space, mimicking the natural forest system, mimicking the, the forest edge, uh, where you have your fruit tree as the canopy, then you have a shrub layer with some berries, some currants, um, could be blueberries, and then underneath that, you have herbaceous layer with things that, um, like your rhubarb and asparagus, and walking onions are pretty cool, and then tons of native flowers, aster is really great, blue false indigo, still be these are all awesome uh, pollinator attractors, which will help pollinate the fruit trees. They also attract different wasps that can kill you know, beneficial, pe uh, beneficial pests that can kill detrimental pests. And uh, just working with nature in this way and, and um, helping design it the way that it has evolved over time and just wants to live. And then you fill the space. So there's no soil. You have a time ground cover when you walk in. It crunches and smells so good. Um, yeah, so fruit trees are awesome. And then again, a little philosophical on this end, but it's all about creating a resilient society. And this is why I'm so passionate about it because I understand that the systems that support us on a large global scale are so fragile. It won't take much. Like what I mentioned before, storms, pandemics, power outages, these things can dramatically disrupt our systems and it 
it's devastating and it's can lead to a lot of stress anxiety and depression because we're so dependent on huge corporations and government to save us and to feed us that it's 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 we're a sense of helplessness whereas if we are if we know how to grow our own food and and we can take care of ourselves and our health and we know how to create our own medicine and which herbs are best for certain ailments like that's it's so empowering and that helps avoid that that dependency and uh, it's awesome like imagine if everybody did that if we all just knew how to take care of ourselves and we didn't have to rely on huge mega corporations to feed us like I don't know it makes sense to me if we if we did that in such a way that it we work together as a community and we alleviate all the pressure that we're putting on these systems um, it's I think it's essential. I think it's the most dire thing in our world today that we have to do this. We just not an option anymore. Like if we break the system, the ecological systems, like nature reacts in the way that she does and has no emotion in the sense that like, oh, we eliminated all the bees. Now there's no pollinators. Now we have no food. It was a dramatic food shortage. And like, what does that mean? So uh, it's a lot better way. We can do it in our own backyards, grow our own food while improving our mental health, our physical health, and the ecological health around us. It just makes sense. And this is what it can look like. You know, a lot of people can't imagine what is an edible ecosystem? What is an edible landscape? Uh, it's beauty. And I think it's so important. What I try to do in my work is blend beauty and function um, in such a way that you have a grass yard, backyard, and you can turn it into something like this. Think about the experience you get when you step out your back door, if this was just grass, or if you stepped out and it was like this. With tons of diversity and, and beauty and function and multiple functions stacked on top of each other. And it just, it just makes sense to me. Like I said, walking through an arbor, getting home from a stressful day at work, as soon as you cross that threshold, think about the smells that you would smell. Think about the colors of the flowers, the sounds, the buzzing of the bees, the chirping of the birds. And you pick some berries on your way, the taste. Like we're creating these sensational outdoor spaces. Reconnecting with nature in a way that we've, we've lost over the years. We don't have to go to the mountains. We don't have to go camping, go on this big retreat to experience it. We can have it in our backyard. All we need to do is get rid of more grass, <laughs> plant more flowers, and berries, and fruits, and herbs. That's all creeping time growing between those stones. Every step you take is just a burst of aroma. This is just a grassy, shady backyard. Even when there is shade, you might not be able to grow a lot of fruit, but you can do a whole lot more. Different textures and foliages. Shades of green. Depending on how far you want to take it. Have a full homestead. Self-sufficiency. Have chickens. Have a small farm where you sell some extra produce. You give it away to your neighbors. I love this example. This is right side by side. This was just a grass lawn, and they only converted one side into this. Almost everything in here is either edible, medicinal, or has an important ecological function. This was just planted this day, so these will all fill in to cover all the space. It's all strawberry as a ground cover that'll spread and fill in all the under all all the ground cover, and it'll creep over the steps. And so there's just going to be an abundance of strawberries everywhere bunch of blueberries, different fruit trees, and I think it's time. I think it's time for all of us to, to reconsider our options here and think about what it means, what responsibility we have as landowners and as parents, as members of our community. It takes a village. Imagine if everybody in your neighborhood did this. We could totally redefine our relationship with nature and our relationship with each other. So I implore everybody to get your garden started. Now's the time. It's awesome. 
And um, thank you so much. That's all I have. Uh, I will share, here's my, my contact info here. Uh, you can feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all. I do consultations and stuff, but um, what I love most is just sharing and inspiring others to, uh, to just reconsider their grass lawns. And so thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Nate. Really appreciate it. Great information. Um, I know that there were some questions. I think you covered most of the topics um, with regard to some of the questions that were out there. But if anyone has any questions that they would like me to filter over to uh, Nate, or if you want to ask him yourself, um, feel free to as well. Um, but again, thank you. This, this has been wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye.